Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Whitaker, and you're all very welcome to today's lunchtime lecture on structural inequalities in the UK. Uh, the first of the new term, I believe. Of course, unusual format, fitting our unusual times. Uh, and as ever with these things, we first and foremost hope the technology holds up. Um, but it's also a slightly unusual setup. I'm your chair, but I've got no UCL affiliation whatsoever. Uh, and I've also been encouraged by our two speakers to serve as an active chair rather than just a, an honest broker, which means I've got license to say a bit more than a chair uh, might normally do, which is a, a, a dangerous request, I think, because we're here to talk about structural inequality. And you might have noticed that I'm a white man. Uh, and we, as a rule, definitely don't need much encouragement to hog the platform. Uh, so let's see how this goes. Um, well, what sits behind it is, um, is the fact that I've actually been working with Olivia and Siobhan in different ways for a couple of years now co-chairing the project that they're going to discuss this afternoon uh, and now working on a, a new venture actually. Um, so I think having worked with them a bit what they're encouraging me to do is to, to be more active in the hope that if there's any tricky questions later on uh, they can throw them at me. Um, so just to give you a quick sense of, of who I am and why I'm here. Um, so over the two years I've been working with the Living Shavon and I've, I've had a couple of day jobs. Uh, so I'd spent more than a decade working at um, the economic think tank Resolution Foundation focusing on research, policy work, uh, connected to income inequality. Uh, and I'm now coming up to a year running Pro Bono Economics, uh, which is a charity that provides free economic support to other charities in the name of helping drive wellbeing in the UK. So inequality has been a, a key theme in both of those roles, um, but primarily in terms of economics. And, and really the strength of the work that Olivia and Siobhan are going to outline is that it was cross-disciplinary approach to, to unpicking, I think, the, the messier reality inequality in the UK, the, sort of the way in which the economic and social in, uh, inequality interact. Um, because ultimately structural inequality, which is what we're talking about today, by definition, uh, is difficult to deal with. It's about more than tweaking bits of policy here and there in isolation. It, it requires a fundamental change really in the way we think about research and the way we think about policy making. Uh, and that means working collaboratively. Uh, and it means asking difficult questions. And that's very much what uh, Olivia and Siobhan's work has been uh, focused on. So it's hard work, um, but also not something that's going to go away overnight, uh, which has pros and cons. So I think unlike a lot of other projects that have been derailed by COVID-19, because attention has, has naturally been elsewhere, this is actually one where, for sad reasons, um, the pandemic has, has increased attention uh, and indeed urgency for action. So when the government talks about building back better, um, that's a nice phrase, but it feels slightly hollow if, if we're not getting to grips with the structural inequality which we see playing out um, in the way COVID-19 has impacted on different groups. You know, there's a real sort of sense that um, everything we've been talking about has been brought to life very much by what's happened in recent months. So I'll stop there um, and make way for the main event. Uh, we have a, an excellent double act for you, two people who deserve a lot of credit actually for, for really pushing this agenda forward, um, both in terms of research but also in, in terms of connecting that into the policy world um, and I've been fortunate to be part of that and see um, just how, how dedicated uh, they are and how fruitful it's been, actually. So Dr. Olivia Stevenson is head of UCL Public Policy, which is UCL's flagship initiative to support academic policy engagement. Uh, she's a co-founder of the University's Policy Engagement Network and is involved in the area of research interest in equality and diversity work. Olivia has delivered a range of internationally recognised high impact research projects published widely. Uh, most recently on structural and relational inequalities, and currently Olivia's part of a £4 million Research England project, uh, Capabilities in Academic Policy Engagement. Uh, we have Siobhan, Siobhan Norris, uh, Morris as well, who leads UCL's Grand Challenge of Justice and Equality, based in the Office of the Vice Provost Research, uh, working with academics and external partners to convene cross-disciplinary collaborations that explore interconnected solutions to areas of, of pressing societal concern. Um, and it was Siobhan really who conceived of and then and then subsequently led the the project that's going to be discussed today between UCL and Resolution Foundation, the Exploring Inequalities project, and then its final report, Structurally and Sound. Um, and more broadly, Siobhan has experience in leading award-winning academic projects, research centres, and public engagement activities. So hugely well qualified, uh, and I can testify as well, they're both lovely people. Um, so they're going to speak for about 35 minutes, and then we'll get into some Q&A. We'll take questions via Slido. Uh, and you should have had joining instructions in the event information you received, uh, and hopefully they're visible on screen as well. Um, so do please post your questions. I'm sure Olivia and Siobhan will provoke lots of thought, um, but I will hand over to them, I think, Olivia, in the first instance. 
Great, thank you, Matt. Thanks for such a great introduction, and it's an absolute pleasure to be uh, bringing this team or this partial team back together uh, today to um, discuss it, to be discussing with the audience a year-long co-produced academic policy engagement synthesis project. What a mouthful, the title doesn't help either, but exploring inequalities, igniting research to better inform UK policy. Um, so we should say, as Matt's already done, um, the project was actually led by Siobhan Morris with support from myself, co-chaired by UCL's pro Professor Nick Gallant, and also uh, Matt Whitaker, who was then Deputy Director at the Resolution Foundation. But we'd also like to acknowledge the wider team, um, and that includes Fermida Rahman, who was at the uh, Resolution Foundation, Oliver Patel, Dr. Claire Stainforth, and Catherine Welsh, all at UCL, who all played a um, significant part in making this project um, come to life and taking it through its many stages that you're going to hear about today. So, in terms of what we're going to talk about and what our presentation is going to cover off, we wanted to spend some time setting inequalities in context and sort of delving into some of the stats and sort of indicating that this isn't actually a new area, as Matt's um, just said, and certainly isn't a new problem. We then plan to provide an overview of sort of what we did and what was involved. Um, before going on then to just talk about what we found and to outline eventually what we landed on, which was our five approaches to equity. <laughs> Given the fact that we've got quite a mixed audience here today, we also wanted to spend some time reflecting with you, and perhaps we can pick this up in the Q&A, but about the kind of messy nature of doing these types of projects and some of the challenges and opportunities that it presented um, and what that kind of means for knowledge exchange agendas going forward in university settings. Um, the project was done pre-COVID. Um, so the first part of the presentation and talk won't really be picking up on that but we obviously don't want that to be the elephant in the room and we plan to bring um i suppose our thoughts up to date and set them within a covid landscape before finally concluding by remarking on how this is a crowded space so how do you carve out a space to look at uh intersectional inequalities and where is the kind of project agendas going from here So to start off then, I think you could choose any year at random over the last 50 years and you'd almost certainly find a piece of legislation focused on um, outlawing inequalities in essence. So from the Equal Pay Act of 1970s to the Employment Equalities Act of 2005 to the Race Relations Act of 1976 to the Racial and Religious Hatred Act of 2006. So you can see that successive governments have put a lot of store and considerable resources into outlining in, outlawing inequalities and unacceptable behaviour in the hope that we can create more inclusive societies. And actually, there's quite a lot to show from this effort, which indicates the importance of legislation in this area. So, for example, the gender pay gap for full-time employees has fallen from 17% in the late 1990s to 8.6% in 2019. And the introduction of gender pay gap reporting, which currently is on hold due to COVID, but we hope that will only be temporary, um, could actually drive down these gaps uh, even further. Social progress is also evident in that um, you can see, for example, the passing of same-sex marriage, marking a significant stride forward in tackling structural inequalities on the basis of sexual orientation. Yet, despite these legislative measures, stark inequalities remain stubbornly embedded in UK society. Uh, thank you, Sana, for moving the slide on. You can see in this slide then, if we look at um, employment, you can see that things have been getting better. Looking at the gaps between the yellow and the purple dots, which I hope you can see clearly in the audience, at 67%, the portion of black, Asian and minority ethnic adults in works increased significantly from a rate of 61% recorded just a decade ago. 
but it still lags behind the rate recorded for the white population by 10.6%. If we could move to the next slide, Sana. So looking at this slide, if we delve underneath the same figures, we can see that things were getting better, but only to a point. In the period from 2016 to 2018, the employment data for disabled Bangladeshi and Pakistani women was just 21% as compared to a rate of 51% for disabled Indian women and 44% for disabled black women. Next slide, please, Sana. And it's a similar picture on pay. So in raw terms, the average hourly pay of black male graduates is 24% lower than that recorded amongst white male graduates. And even when you control for characteristics of the two populations and the jobs they do, the gap remains stubbornly in place. This is where we compare workers and jobs that differ only in terms of the color of a person's skin. The pay gap uh, is 17%, a pay gap of 17% is still recorded, which is absolutely uh, shocking. Next slide, please, Sana. So such inequity has a clear effect across an individual's life. And you can see on this, uh, slide with regard to home ownership, black families in the UK are less than half as likely as white families to be homeowners. The figures are also particularly low for Bangladeshi and Pakistani groups at 34% respectively. Other examples exist as well. So if we take disability and there's a disability employment gap remains exceptionally high at 31% in 2018. And I always find this quite a quite a hard thing to hear. Um, as a result, disabled job seekers apply for 60% more jobs than non-disabled people. Furthermore, place clearly matters. 48% of black, Asian and minority ethnic groups in Northern Ireland are employed, whereas over 76% are employed in the southeast of England. So we can see disparities by geography. Next slide, please, Sana. Inequalities in health have uh, not only persisted in the past decade, but gaps between the richest and the poorest have widened in some areas. UK life expectancy has plateaued at a level below that of much of Europe. And strikingly in England in recent years, life expectancy actually fell for women in the most deprived areas. With regards to the gap in health life expectancy, that is years lived in good health, between the most and least deprived areas of England, this is around 19 years for both men and women. If we look at Wales, the figures are nine years for men and eight years for women respectively. And if we look at Scotland, the gap is 23.8 years for men and 22.6 years for women. Clearly then, structural inequalities exist and are embedded throughout UK society. The multiple contributing factors to deprivation levels speak to ways that compound inequalities for certain groups, as well as the intersection of education, employment and housing impact health and well-being. However, we have a lack of data on life expectancy for other subgroups, such as particular ethnic groups, and so it makes it difficult to measure the extent to which this intersects with groups facing other forms of structural disadvantage. Next slide, please, Sana. So I want to just pick back up on that point, the last point about intersections, which was um, very pertinent to, to our project indeed, and has been something that we've been championing um, long after it's been finished. So we're returning obviously to a slide that we've seen before. So whilst the presentation of stats that we've just focused on is important in building up a picture of inequalities and kind of contextualizing and charting their history, what we actually want to highlight is that in employment data as an indication of labor markets, but equally could look at other forms of data, serves to show how vital it is to adopt an intersectional approach when examining inequalities. Now, this is because this approach is adopted uh, 
through from, if we adopt this approach, through from data collection to analysis to presentation, we can recognize that inequalities faced by women, for example, of color, are not the same as those faced by white women with a racial element just simply added on. They're fundamentally different. So, for example, if we focus back in on the slide, we can begin to see that the figures show an unemployment rate of 2.9% for non-disabled white women. This figure jumps to 7% for non-disabled black, Asian and minority ethnic women and 14% for disabled black, Asian and minority ethnic women. It's important to recognise that analysing data under broad terms such as BAME, which is often used to describe black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, is often not sufficient. Delving underneath headline figures, the employment rate for disabled Bangladeshi and Pakistani women was just 21% as compared to a rate of 51% for disabled Indian women and 44% for disabled black women. The slow uptake of an intersectional approach married with a lack of data on particular ethnic groups under this broad um, term of BAME makes it difficult to measure the extent to which inequalities of health, housing, education and employment intersect with groups facing a range of structural disadvantage. Next slide, please, Sana, and over to you, Siobhan. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, so yes, as Olivia has outlined, inequalities in the UK are clearly structural, persistent, and they're multiple. But in many ways, this is the problem statement. Um, however, of course, as you know, Matt was outlining at the start as well, this isn't new. Inequalities in the separate domains of education, employment, health and housing are widely known and they're well researched. Therefore, through our collaboration with the Resolution Foundation, we instead set out to take a slightly different approach to what had gone before. Instead, adopting a holistic view of inequalities, that intersectional point that Olivia was just explaining seeking to dismantle disciplinary or policy silos and deliberately work across multiple sectors to take a kind of overarching or zoomed out analysis of these issues. So how did we do it? What did we do? So we brought together a range of leading experts and senior figures from academia, third sector organisations, business, government and policy spheres to review, synthesise and deepen our shared understanding of inequalities in the UK. There were over 50 different organisations involved, a snapshot of which are on the screen. Can't squeeze everyone in, I'm afraid. Um, Sana, if you could click through to the next slide, please. So what did we actually do and what did we actually find? Well, over the course of a series of roundtables, supplemented by additional expert in-depth interviews, we brought together this diverse range of perspectives, sectors and experiences that I was just outlining. So this slide, uh, which you can hopefully all, all read, um, charts the timeline for the project from its inception to completion in order to try and illustrate and give some idea of the time and sheer resource that a project like this takes, but also the varied impacts that it can have. So as I said, the project was designed to be deliberately broad in scope and take a policy lens rather than a protected characteristic approach. So that meant focusing on interrelated inequalities across four key policy areas, education, employment, health and housing to structure discussions rather than say across uh, round tables on ethnicity, gender, disability, age, etc. This um, was recognizing that inequalities are multiple, cumulative and cut across all disciplines topics of research and policy areas. So discussions took place over the course of nine months, which we then pulled together in a final report, Structurally Unsound, and a set of four action notes. So again, if we can click through to the next slide, please, Anna. So in the final report, we deliberately didn't produce policy recommendations. Rather, we identified five approaches for equity, as we called them, which we believe warrant consideration by all members of the research and policy making communities who want to more effectively tackle inequalities. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time fleshing out what we mean underneath these five key approaches. So the first one was language. 
recognizing that language matters. The report advocates for the need to develop a consistent approach to defining the terms used and a greater shared understanding of how language is used across both different disciplines and different sectors. That means recognizing that the terms used to evidence inequalities hold significance for what is both captured and measured. So for example, multiple terms used in, cent in the central UK government, um, so social mobility, obviously used by the Social Mobility Commission, equality, the Government Equalities Office, injustice in the Office for Tackling Injustices, there's all these different terms floating around. And that makes it problematic to share data, conduct cross-cutting analysis and to evaluate policies. So there's this need to better understand the different outcomes that are meant by the use of these different terms. Secondly, opportunity, shifting the focus onto equity. So what do we mean by that? Well, whilst legislation protects against overt discrimination um, on the terms of protected characteristics, as Olivia was outlining right at the start, inequalities in terms of indirect barriers and inequity of opportunity undoubtedly still persists. So there's a clear need to distinguish between direct and indirect barriers in society. It is this commodification of choice and consequently opportunity, whether through school choices, quality of housing, access to health services, um, social capital and economic activity that research can tease out and policy should recognise. Uh, but we, we argued that as long as such commodification exists, simply increasing choice will not be the answer because such disadvantages in social structures result in inequalities that emerge before birth, accumulate and then compound throughout an individual's life, so this kind of life course approach. And so therefore they can't simply be alleviated by just increasing access to opportunity or individual choice alone. So put simply, treating everyone the same, equality, does not therefore provide people with the same opportunities. So instead, focusing on equity, uh, researchers and policymakers can better determine how to surmount or even better remove the barriers faced by different groups. Thirdly, understanding evidence, ensuring diversity of evidence in decision making. So we argue for adopting an intersectional perspective, as Olivia outlined, um, to identify gaps in our shared understanding and elevating the status of qualitative research to plug key evidence gaps using data, descriptions and diversity. So again, to kind of flesh this out and give an example, an evidence gap lies in local authorities and the Office for National Statistics, not routinely nor systematically collecting data on sexual orientation and gender identity. As a consequence, there's this understanding of inequality based on sexual orientation is often incomplete and these evidence gaps uh, are present at every stage of the life course. We also identified that there's an urgent need for academics, analysts and researchers to consider how best to future-proof data collection, so as to allow access to continuous, comparable data sets that will hopefully allow for change to be tracked over time. For example, if you're looking to understand health inequalities and, say, the relationship to education and work, then surveys and data questions looking you know across the life course need to be adapted to fit shifting definitions of mental health fourth voice changing the structure of society by changing who designs it so really what we mean by this is raising the voices and representation of disadvantaged groups both in research agendas and in policy spheres so ensuring measures to address social inequalities are implemented in conjunction with and not on experience individuals experiencing disadvantage at the moment again to to can give some indicative stats those that make policy and deliver services are not representative of those that they affect uh, for example in 40 local authorities in england with black asian and minority ethnic populations of between six percent and twelve percent they either have zero BAME representation or one BAME counselor and then finally, place, adopting a place-based approach. As we've had throughout um, today in the statistics, place clearly matters and the experience of inequalities is heavily intertwined with place. 
So tackling issues at the right level is paramount. Localisation agendas and the UK government's statement, stated commitment to levelling up, introduced after our uh, project had finished, but you know, we'll, we'll leave that one there, <laughs> um, must therefore be careful not to leave anyone behind. So, uh, Sana, if we can click through to the next slide, and Olivia will take us through some of the key outcomes to date. So thanks, Sean. So you've heard um, that our project uh, contained a vast range of stakeholders, multiple interviews, was done through a roundtable format, producing a synthesis uh, state of play report. So from our perspective, that was quite a different way to conduct a project. It was something we hadn't done before. So did this sort of different project make up and um, configuration and approach pay off well we believe so and we think this this slide kind of illustrates a snapshot of that um to talk you through i suppose uh, our five approaches to equity have been picked up in national media referenced during debates in the house of lords published in multiple leading sector um uh, publications presented in government forums to government departments and provided um, platforms, I suppose, at numerous, numerous events. <clears throat> we were able to forge new networks that didn't exist uh, both for us personally previously, but also within those that attended the round tables and took part in the, in the writing. Um, and people have gone on to develop subsequent um, collaborations. And perhaps Matt can tell us a little bit about that um, as we go, when we come to the end. Um, in relation to us, for example, we've been asked to partner with the CBI on their London Business Survey this year. And we've also been approached by um, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority to talk to them about um, how they structure their research and development programmes to take greater account of our approaches to equity. We've also been engaging um, with think tanks and most recently, um, for example, Policy Connect on their thinking around intersectional data and, and disability. Reflecting more generally, the project has definitely deepened ours and our stakeholders' collective understanding of structural inequalities in the UK as cut across these four policy domains. But it has also been a catalyst to turn the lens back on ourselves. Often when we're conducting projects of this nature or academic policy engagement, it's often from a sense of talking out from UCL to those policy makers or, or those people in the third sector. But actually, we turned the lens on ourselves and have been doing some thinking about how to structure our programmes and projects in a more equitable way. Next slide, please, Sana. So we're certainly happy with the level of traction gained from this synthesis study. And actually, I think it went beyond what any of us could have conceived um, from the outset and thought was possible. But don't just take our words for it. Um, the reflections collected from project members and as illustrated on the slides um, also kind of demonstrate some of what we've just been talking about. What comes through strongly um, is the feeling of the kind of intrinsic value of being part of this type of project. But the project itself also had varied and multifaceted impacts on both the members themselves, but also the work that they've gone on to do subsequently. But whilst this might be, I suppose the positive spin, whilst this might be quite familiar to an audience like this, and you might have been at numerous talks where people I suppose are wanting to put that kind of uh, positive message out there, which we certainly want to do as well. But we also wanted to take this moment to share with you and perhaps pick back up on in the questions, some of the hidden work that went into delivering a project of this kind of nature. Um, because we think it's really important to create honest spaces for dialogues about failures, uncertainties, uncomfortability even, as well as um, successes, so that we can kind of learn more about the processes and the products and the, and the, and the outputs of, the, of, of this type of work. And we think this is especially important given the kind of 
universities are being pushed to be more ambitious in their knowledge exchange agendas and have kind of positive impacts recognized. So we think it's important to kind of be quite reflective of these types of projects. So if we could sort of pick that up and, and, and illustrate it through a few points. Utilising an inclusive way of working in a multi-partnership and cross-sector project focused on inequalities is really quite complex to say the least. As is aligning project goals with each member's needs, ideals, values, organisations, purposes, uh, what essentially they all wanted to get out of the project. This required us as a project team to give up a sort of degree of our own knowledge ownership and actively work to dismantle the privilege that certain types of knowledges um, can bring to enable multiple forms of research and evidence to intersect, but also to allow for everybody's voice to be heard and to be kind of equally, equally weighted. So it wasn't really a question of those in a research setting knew more than those in a, in a, in a policy think tank, for example. However, at times, this kind of balancing and tension uh, had a hidden effect of making the project team question whether the wider stakeholders actually valued our contributions, because in this case, we were playing the role of knowledge brokers as opposed to research experts. Another point that kind of goes back to impacts is the focus um, and value is frequently placed on the final product, inverted commas, uh, rather than convening the expertise. Yet we found few accessible avenues really to publish a kind of synthesis report of the nature that we produced. So therefore, how do you evidence your, your, your impact? Um, this kind of places constraints on a type of project that's encouraged under a knowledge exchange agendas and doesn't really recognize, as we've mentioned before, the intrinsic value of working across sectors, which of course was actually the most important part really to those stakeholders that took part. In reality, there is no one success. It looks different depending on different members' perspectives. Um, and as a result, you know, we want KE practitioners like ourselves and the wider sector, also the frameworks that wrap around it and the instruments for measurement to be kind of aware of this and responsive to this and to go beyond simplicity and standard measures for evaluation. Because otherwise, I think we risk a generation of eager collaborators being undervalued for the ways that they contribute to delivering public good. But equally, we need a greater conversation on the failures of impact work, and especially in areas where it almost feels like a too big a risk to fail. And I think that certainly feels the case for when you're working in an inequalities agenda. And also when you're working in academic policy engagement, where the language doesn't lend itself to anything other than policy change. Next slide, please, Sana, and back to you, Siobhan. Great, thanks, Olivia. So, as we mentioned at the start, quite a lot has changed since the project officially drew to a close uh, last year. Um, obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic has undoubtedly shone a light on and exacerbated the embedded inequalities that we, we've been talking about in, in UK society. But it's also shown the intersections between interlinking health, social and economic inequalities. So returning to a focus on statistics for a moment to, to bring this up to date, um, put starkly the, the mortality rates from COVID in England have shown that those living in the most deprived areas are twice as likely to die from COVID-19 as those in the least deprived. Statistics also show that black men are more than four times more likely to die from COVID-19 than their white counterparts. Likewise, during the height of hospitalizations earlier this year, non-white patients made up more than 34% of those in intensive care. Uh, similarly, recent data released by the ONS, uh, Office for National Statistics, I should say, has also shown that a third of all lives lost to COVID-19 in the UK to date have been disabled people. 
the data is sadly even starker when disaggregated by gender. So disabled women under 65 with limiting disabilities are more than 11 times more likely to die from COVID than, uh, than non-disabled women. Uh, in comparison, disabled men aged under 65 with limiting disabilities are six and a half times more likely to die. So women are also more than twice as likely to be key workers than men, uh, are also the lowest paid and overwhelmingly make up those working in undervalued caring roles. And the national lockdown earlier this year uh, in the UK led to a 50% increase in demand for refugees national domestic abuse hotline. So sadly, in many ways, uh, both the project, um, the issue, the problem statement, its findings, all of this is still and is more relevant now in many ways than ever. And the COVID pandemic has also highlighted and amplified inequalities in academia. To pick back up on some of the points that we were starting to reflect on about the actual doing of a project such as this. So for example, um, with many women taking on caring responsibilities, homeschooling, unpaid domestic work during lockdown, uh, studies have shown that the number of male preprint preprint authors grew faster than the number of female preprint authors. So in other words, on average, women are not advancing their research as much as men during the pandemic. Third, of the papers that were submitted, fewer women were thirst authors on articles related to COVID-19. So a group of leading female scientists highlighted recently that women are advising policymakers on the outbreak, designing clinical trials, coordinating field studies, leading data collection and analysis. But when it comes to the media coverage, there is a bias towards men. So while neither epidemiology nor medicine are male dominated fields, men are still getting quoted far more often than women are about the pandemic. So as Olivia mentioned, it's important to recognize both the time and the resource needed to do this sort of work, but also to start to raise the questions of situating it in the now and saying, what does the COVID-19 pandemic mean for inequalities within knowledge exchange work itself? Both for how you do it well, but also how you recognize the constraints and adjust to current rapid timescales required by policy professionals and the third sector actors that you might be working with. So finally, Sana, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, where and what next? Quite big questions. Um, so as we've said, COVID-19 has firmly shone the spotlight on social inequities and put an inequalities agenda on the political and policy map. As we've spoken about with significant coverage in the national media, all the major political parties commissioning reviews into the disproportionate effects of COVID-19 on black Asian and minority ethnic communities, and such has been the reach of the pandemic, there's been recognition and stated commitment across the political spectrum to build back better. There is a sense of a real moment for change. So amid the despair and hardship that sits behind the horrific stats of the current crisis that we've been outlining, there is this sense of a moment of opportunity. But just because the agenda is current and attracting a lot of attention, it doesn't mean that change will naturally follow. There's an opportunity to, re to return to something better than normal, in inverted commas, but there is that risk that we rush to something which is kind of good enough, doesn't really affect structural change. But change rests too on further developing the evidence base. That means both in terms of more accurately capturing the nuance of the problem statement, those intersections that we've been talking about a lot, but also better understanding what works when it comes to policy interventions, the evaluation point again. More broadly, um, as we pose in our report, in the Structurally Unsound reports, and has further undoubtedly been highlighted by COVID, the place-based nature of inequalities across the UK raises the question of whether it is possible and indeed helpful to create a national narrative on social inequalities in the UK. So to conclude, as outlined, inequalities in UK society are multiple and structural in nature and they require an intersectional approach to be truly understood and tackled. 
as a result if you want to do inequalities work well as it were and begin to actively affect change then it's imperative to become comfortable working across different domains and different sectors to be alive and attuned to all the different potential stakeholders and not be afraid not be afraid to pivot your project and your work accordingly uh, so as we've said that meant for us deliberately not making a set of policy recommendations or addressing just one single sector in our final report instead recognizing the intersectionality needed but we don't make any bones about how challenging it is to truly work at the intersections but it is work that is desperately needed so understanding how structural inequalities play out across different groups different places different points in time requires the adoption of a new focus within the researcher and policymaking communities. So the project and its final report show how our understanding and conceptions of inequalities has changed over time, and undoubtedly the vast amount of good work and progress that's been won. But key evidence gaps remain, and the challenge now is how we mainstream all of this thinking into policy and research agendas. How do we make the most of this seeming moment for change? And to affect such change requires building coalitions and recognizing the importance of alliances across different sectors. Universities have a vital role to play, but they can't do such work alone. So I'm gonna ask Matt to, to come in here and give possibly his key reflections, um, takeaways from the project and draw us to a close for the Q&A. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, thanks, Olivia, too. Um, that is a, a tour de force. Um, I hesitate to say it is um, it's great because there's just a lot of depressing stuff in there. But I think what is great is um, the extent to which alongside those sort of tough statistics and difficult messages, there is some optimism in there as well, um, some good news. And I think that's, a, that's the balance which as a country, certainly for the government, that is the balance that needs to be struck right now of these are extraordinary and difficult times, but there has to be some light at the end of the tunnel. It can't all be doom and gloom, but you don't get there by accident. You get there by working um, very hard towards a shared goal. And for me, the, the sort of the key takeaway from this whole project was just how valuable actually this sort working in this way is. So I, when Siobhan first came to me when I was at Resolution Foundation and said, with the idea of the project um i jumped at it because it seemed like a great thing but i was also fair to say pretty terrified because it was a very different way of approaching work to to what i was used to doing um sort of felt like i had no linearity to it no sense of here's my exam question and here's what the out looks like uh, 12 months from now instead it was much more sort of like build it and they will come type approach um, and that was scary um and it was hard work I think it's fair to say. Um, in the background, I think as Olivia pointed out, lots going on to, to make that work. It wasn't just a case of turning up, having some conversations with some experts and, and magic happening. Uh, we had to push really hard at it, but magic did happen. It did generate some really good stuff. And in many ways, the, the nicest um, moment of the whole project was as we sort of came towards the end, we went around the room of all those different organizations that you saw listed before. Uh, and asked those people who'd been involved in the project what they would take away. Every person had a slightly different perspective, but a really powerful one of, of ways in which they would change the way they worked uh, going forward. And in particular, I think, I think again, they're in some, some of Olivia's quotes before, um, people who, I always said, you know, people who should have known each other, who didn't necessarily know each other, getting to know each other, and then actually deciding that they could work on things together in order to produce new things um, was particularly gratifying and something that we sort of hoped for, but didn't, didn't necessarily expect and um, were very pleased with. And I, I mean, it gave me a very clear sense by the end that the sort of three things that matter in the research and policy world, there's the stuff we don't know where the answer is do more research. The stuff we can't know where the answer is develop better data, better information. Uh, and the stuff we do know where change isn't happening and that's about having a better link into policy uh, having those stories and I think what this project showed is, is if you can pull together 
across disciplines and across different organizations to collectively try and get to the um, the nub of those three problems then then you can make real progress and i think that's where we are at the moment in terms of uh, the build back better agenda that is what we need to be doing um but i'll stop there we've, we're starting to get some questions through uh, please do continue to post questions in the uh, slido um uh forum uh, so i'm going to throw to uh, siobhan in the first instance or this first question here which is uh reflecting on why you structured the project across all policy domains rather than across protected characteristics what was lost what was gained i think we've done lots of these things together uh, over the last year or so and the question that often comes up straight away is isn't it doesn't it all boil down to class um and i think you know the work we've done has shown that um that is not true class is a very important factor here but those intersectionalities um tend to get lost if you just hammer at something from one particular angle but um, and I think that was sitting behind a large part of why the project was designed as it was. But Siobhan, do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, thanks, Matt. So exactly that. Um, I suppose we we debated for quite a long time, actually, how we would structure the project um, in terms of what would be the kind of starting point for discussions at the round table. And there was a lot of discussion around if, you know, if you had a round table on gender and then a round table on age and then a round table on ethnicity well actually aren't you just perpetuating some kind of hierarchies of inequalities in themselves um what are you kind of placing as your uh one different domain on top of another in that sense you're not actually getting at the intersections as matt was outlining right at the start it's that messiness of life it's the intrinsic nature of all of this there's not you know if you're um, a black disabled woman you're not separating out in in your own thinking of oh that's my disadvantage on the basis of um, my gender that's my disadvantage that I'm facing on the basis of um, being disabled or whatever it might be that that's not how it works that's not how policy world works that's not how um, life works so we decided that obviously there had to be some form of structure and um, we couldn't just say just about whatever you like so so instead we went for the the policy domains as our way of of framing this and, and trying to access the intersections um by talking about all of the different protected characteristics in each round table instead so that was our thinking behind it as, as you said matt it definitely opened up some opportunities you, you started to be able to get um a good sense of exactly where evidence gaps exist so exactly as you were talking about evidence gaps in terms of just sheer data gaps of we just don't know this stuff because it's not being collected and then evidence gaps in the sense of there's different domains uh have done different bits of research um so you know it might be some educational research but it's not been linked up with um health research uh so there was a kind of pulling together point there but definitely the challenges, you know, were, were that it, it can be structured in multiple different ways. And so pulling it all together in the end is, is very hard. Yeah, that final report, um, I was pleased not to be working too hard on that particular one, leaving that to other people. Um, next one, while, while, whilst you're speaking, let's just jump to uh, another one here, which I think is probably more for you. And then I'll come back to um, a question from James for Olivia in a minute. Um, which is just this one on your opinion on the equality of outcome versus equality of opportunity and which one can best alleviate economic inequality in a society and that's definitely a question we went around a little bit. My opinion, sorry, I'm, not, I'm sorry. sorry. on uh, equality of outcome versus equality of opportunity, which one we should be focusing on. Okay, yeah. Um, so that's what we're talking about in terms of equality of opportunity um only works so far and if you it only works if you're talking about equity so just kind of giving everyone the same access to opportunity treating everyone the same will not create the same outcomes so that's what we're trying to get at that point around um uh choice being commodified and just simply saying here are more choices for people will not create the same outcomes for different groups within society. 
So um, you need to have a focus on both and an understanding of how the two interact in that sense. Thank you. I'm obsessed at the moment with um, theories of change and logic chains because that's what I've been spending a lot of my time in this I'm new job. I'm deliberately not mentioning theories of change, Matt. <laughs> but um, they, they serve the purpose. They serve the purpose. Uh, Olivia, question from James Paskins, uh, which I think is directly towards you, which is what role do universities have in ensuring there's a coordinated approach to multiple inequalities? Uh, the simple answer is a lot. Um, so, I mean, I think universities, and perhaps I would say this, are the bedrock of our societies and our and our neighbourhoods. We're providing education and provision to young people, helping to support their uh, employment chances and therefore their subsequent life chances. Um, we also are employers, so we have a workforce within within the university who uh, we're able to um, support and think about. Uh, equity issues as, as uh, Siobhan has just uh, outlined um, but what I suppose certain agendas have have inadvertently caused us to do I think is work and I'm and I'm probably there speaking to impact agendas and knowledge exchange agendas is have meant that we've wanted to work in silos and in competition with one another, in competition for, for funding, in competition for students, in competition for how we uh, create change in the local neighbourhoods in which, in which we're in, rather than actually thinking about how can we work most effectively together as a sector um, to think through issues of inequalities and who and how can we um, take you know take uh, a lead to help uh, resolve some of those. I think universities um, also are not the only providers of education. So thinking beyond thinking beyond our walls, taking a life course approach, and thinking about what relationship do we have with schools and FE colleges as well to think about a much larger um, fabric for the sector than necessarily, uh, for example, sitting in UCL Russell Group universities talking to Russell Group universities on 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 these issues. So uh, coming back to the simple answer, a lot. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Very good. I, I, I will take the opportunity to, to, to um, give a plug as well to a um, new project that we're launching at Pro Bono Economics actually um, in, in December, which is going to be a big commission on civil society, uh, which will over the course of two years or so uh, look at lots of different questions. Basically, we're not quite framing it like this, but basically thinking about how do you build back better? But how do you involve civil society in that conversation so that we are not just focusing on what is the private sector doing? We're not just focusing on what is the government doing in the public sector? We're thinking about how are, how are those two sectors working alongside civil society, by which we mean charities, community organisations, social enterprises, universities, trade unions, all of those different and um, civic groups, if you like, um, in order to come together to, to drive a sort of build back better agenda. So I think this, this point of universities working collaboratively, working together towards a shared agenda, shared goals um, is really important. And actually I would spread it beyond just universities working together, but actually universities working with other institutions and organizations in their, in their area um, and more generally. Um, right, let's have a look. So I am going to, yep, yeah, I think, I will make this the last question to you, Olivia, unless somebody else uh, posts a question while you're answering, and then we'll wrap up maybe a couple of minutes early. But it's a it's a big question, which is uh, what are you doing next as a result of this project, and how you're embedding the learning. Oh, hang on, there is one more just come through. Good examples of co-produced policy development and research with marginalised communities in the UK. Okay, that is a good question, which I'll throw in there as well um, from Pfizer. Is that okay. one of I'll take the first one uh, and Siobhan can perhaps I can iterate the second one. Um, so what are we doing next? There are multiple threads that are flowing out of um, this, this project and this collaboration. As hinted at, um, what became really apparent here, I think, was about the importance of turning the lens back on ourselves and thinking about the kind of programmes that we're involved in. I'm very fortunate in that I get 
the opportunity to lead and shape the UCL public policy programme at UCL. So I have a lot of freedom, I think, to think about the projects that we're doing and how we can import the learning. But to kind of give some um, examples uh, of what's happened next as a result of this, uh, we recognised um, both that in the academic policy landscape, there, there are a lot of conversations between what inverted commas could be called the usual suspects. Now, often that stands for um, white male professors. I feel relatively uncomfortable with that because I think the usual suspects extends uh, much more beyond, beyond that. So um, we've been thinking about how do we create um, support systems, opportunities, how do we structure the way that we promote our programme and the activities that you can get involved in to a much more diverse range of people at UCL, but also to a much more diverse range of, of, of disciplines. Because it's not just about uh, usual suspects in terms of people, it's also about having a diversity of thought. So parts of the ways that we've been doing that is that we've um, created um, different avenues for promoting promoting the things that we do and helping people to get involved we've um themed uh we have a new post in our team who's directly responsible for supporting uh, underrepresented groups at ucl to get involved in academic policy engagement we've been running some masterclass training programs specifically focused for underrepresented groups to kind of understand what some of the structural barriers are to them engaging in academic policy engagement but also helping them on their journey to picking up those skills, techniques and, and getting involved and kind of giving it a go, because actually that's the ethos of the program um, that I run. Let's just give it a go and see and see where it see where it lands. Um, there's actually been a lot of changes at UCL. Um, just recently, the new EDI strategy uh, 2021, if you've not had a chance to have a look at it, makes for very interesting, interesting reading. And um, we're, there is the plans that there will be a pro vice provost for equity and inclusion. So we're very much hoping that we can work alongside them um, to help uh, support some of the thinking and the building of data dashboards and so on and so forth so that UCL can really get to grips I think with kind of uh, bringing its ethos into uh, a 20 cent 22nd century uh, thinking really. Um, also between um, core members of the project we've been thinking about well what's what's next what's next for us where do we want to take uh, the five approaches to equity and how do we want to kind of embed them in wider thinking given the COVID landscape. So we have been um, meeting and uh, have launched between us, although not publicly, that will be coming online soon, an alliance for tackling structural inequalities. Um, I think I'll stop there because noticing the time and I'll just let Siobhan perhaps come in on the last question, Matt, which we, you might need to repeat. Thank you. Um, so, Siobhan, uh, are there any good examples of co-produced policy development and research with marginalised communities in the UK? And if not, how do we uh, how do we get them? Yeah, so I think the two examples that immediately spring to mind um, for me are, are both UCL examples. Um, so there's the Centre for Co-Production and Health Research, which is really doing exceptional uh, leading work in the sense of thinking through co-production, working with different groups um, to analyse their health outcomes and their health experiences, um, both in terms of different uh, healthcare settings. Uh, and then there's a lot of work being done, um, the Centre for Inclu Collaborative Centre for Inclusion Health. Um, forgive me, I am terrible with acronyms, but I am pretty sure that's the right way around. Um, which has been doing a lot of work with um, homeless population throughout COVID, especially um, around their experiences of being on the streets, um, uh, being exposed to COVID uh, and asking what do they want from policy. Uh, so they, they've done a lot of successful um, engagement with different policy actors, uh, thinking through not just assuming 
that you know what the answer is for that group um, who are facing obviously multiple disadvantage in society, but actually taking time to speak with them and say, you know, these are different options, what, what, what do you actually want rather than imposing a policy on them? And I think that that really gets to the heart of co-production, but it's a lesson that can be learned in multiple different settings, I suppose, of whether it's an employment setting of speaking to your workforce around what might be the different experiences of disadvantage or different inequalities in, in the labour market in your own um, employees, or whether it's a, a research setting around thinking, how are you structuring a project from the start? Who do you want to speak to? How are you going to engage with different communities and ensure, as we said in the project, ensure that the language that you're using comes from them and that you're working with them, you're not speaking to them. Uh, and so I think those are the two obvious uh, examples, both UCL plugs as well. Um, there are more uh, out with UCL, but as I say, conscious of time, so I'll leave it there. Thank you, John. Um, brilliant. We do need to wrap up there, um, but I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, hope you enjoyed the session. I think we, you know, we obviously could go on for much longer, and hopefully uh, we will have opportunity to um, to pick up conversations going forward. Um, but special thanks, of course, to our speakers, Olivia and Siobhan, for joining us uh, and for all the great work, actually, they've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, so this sort of idea of connecting research and the work of universities with policy is just hugely important and um, seen firsthand it working. So long may it continue. Um, I'm told you'll receive an email in the next day or so with a short feedback survey. Please fill that in. Uh, and also the upcoming schedule of lectures. So hopefully you will be along to another one before too long. Um, but in the meantime, enjoy your afternoons and all the best. Thank you.